If you have a Bible, and if you don't have a Bible, grab one from the pew in front of you. We're going to look at a couple of verses from Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. And as always, I encourage you to keep that Bible open because we'll refer back to this passage as we go along this morning. Romans chapter 12, and we will read verses 1 and 2. Hear the word of the Lord. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And this ends the reading of God's holy word. To him be all power and glory and authority forever. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, as we come to your word this morning, we do pray that your spirit would descend upon us and that you would transform our minds and renew them, that we might hear the will that is yours. And so, Lord, I ask you to remove me from the way and speak to all of us, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I really believe that statistic about percentages of people that fall asleep during worship. As, as most of you probably know, I served in a parish church in Edinburgh, Scotland as an assistant minister for a while. And that church it was called Collington Parish Church. And it was an old, very traditional sanctuary that had one of these really massive pulpits. There was 12 steps to climb up into this pulpit. It was the only place in the sanctuary that everybody could see you. And as you climbed up, you were about 10 feet off the ground. And when you made all those steps, there was a gate that you had to close behind you. I think the gate was there in case you fell backwards <laughs> to stop you. But when you're up there 10 feet off the ground, it's a little... I think this is probably where I learned not to like pulpits. I must have been traumatized or something happened along the way. And by the way, the pulpit in Collington was donated by Robert Louis Stevenson's grandfather, who had, was, the, was a minister in that parish at one time. But I loved going up there because when you go up there, you can see everybody. And when there was one gentleman in particular, his name was Cecil, or as we would say, Cecil. And Cecil was there every Sunday, and it didn't matter what preacher went up and climbed those steps. When that preacher shut the gate behind him, Cecil was like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> he heard that thing click, and this is what he did. The head went back, the eyes closed, and Cecil engaged in a little nap. And he would stay that way until he heard amen. And then he'd open his eyes and it'd be all good. He'd join us again. So when I was up there preaching, I would occasionally just say amen during the sermon. Just to toy with him. But I think that we can all sort of relate to Cecil. I mean, we come to worship sometimes and, well, you know, we might want to take a little nap while we're here and, and we feel a yawn coming on. I, uh, I found a study, it was a true, true study done by the University of Maryland. And in it, there's one sentence out of this study, I found this on the internet. The one sentence out of this study goes like this. Yawning is of medical importance because it is symptomatic of pathologies such as brain lesions and tumors, hemorrhage, motion sickness, and encephalitis. So if you're here this morning and you feel a yawn coming on, I want to warn you that it might be symptomatic of a brain lesion or encephalitis. <laughs> or not. It also might be just a symptom that, well, you're comfortable and, and maybe just a little bit bored. And, and when you get a little bit bored, you get a little sleepy and you feel that yawn coming on. That may be all that it is. 
You see, I think that boring worship is one of the things that the people out there think of, maybe some of us in here, think about what we do together as a church. We are in the series that I have called Sandals, Candles, and Scandals. And, and the idea behind the series is to talk about things, conceptions, that people out there, and again, maybe sometimes people in here, have about our life together. Last week, I used the image of the sandal to talk about a wimpy, anemic Jesus that we gather around and we follow a very unmanly sort of a savior. And, and really, if you follow this sort of man, unmanly, anemic, wimpy kind of Jesus, well, then naturally, your worship is going to be a little boring, not very exciting. So the, the image that I'm using for this morning is a candle. Because we use candles, we have a couple this morning. We use candles in worship, but you know, a candle is just emits this little teeny bit of light. It's soft and it's gentle. It's not loud. It's not a laser show with smoke. It's just well, it's kind of there, and well, it sort of adds to the ambiance of a gentle, sort of warm, sleepy boring kind of experience. Really, I mean, this is kind of what candles do for us. So I'm, I'm, I'm calling this morning uh, candles because we're talking about boring worship because that is what the world tends to think that we do. And if it is boring, you know as well as I do that any excuse not to engage in something that is boring is good news. And oftentimes, we'll find any kind of excuse not to be in worship. I remember hearing about a couple of fishermen who went fishing on a Sunday morning, and they were there all morning, and they didn't catch a thing. And one of the fishermen says to the other, you know, we should have just stayed home and gone to church. Well, the other one said to him, well, I could have stayed home, but I couldn't have gone to church. And he said, well, well, why is that? And the other fisherman said, well, because my wife is sick. <laughs> you did better than the first service. They didn't get that at all. <laughs> For those of you who didn't get it, maybe talk to the person next to you. They'll help you out a little bit. But we do look for any kind of excuse, don't we? Let's admit it. If there's a better offer that comes along, well, we'll do that. We won't go to worship. This is especially true during the summer because we have vacation. And even if we don't have vacation, nobody will know. And we can go do something that else that's fun and the weather's nice and we want to be outside and any little excuse that comes along, we'll take it. You know, the, the statistics about Americans in worship is depressing and becoming even more depressing. As you know, there's a guy named George Gallup who has an organization that polls people on religious sort of issues. And George Gallup says that on any given Sunday, there's about 35 to 37 percent of the American population in worship. And that's based upon a survey where people answer the question, how often do they go to worship? Well, there's a journal called the Soci American Sociological Review that said people don't answer those questions honestly. The truth is, based upon observation, that the statistics are far less than that. In fact, they are below 20% of the American population, and it's dwindling. And I think the motivating issue there is boredom. The, the people tend to avoid worship because they don't want to be bored. No surprise, but I don't want you to be bored either. That may not come as a shock, but it's true. I also don't think that God wants you to be bored. 
I don't think that in worship that God wants to receive the worship of people who are bored to tears. I know this because the Psalms are alive. You know, the Psalms, the book of Psalms, is actually the hymn book for the ancient Israelites. This is what they would sing. And I got one example from you this morning. Actually, we sang it at the beginning of the service, a line out of Psalm 100. Psalm 100 and verse 4 goes like this. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Enter his courts, courts with thanksgiving and give praise. These are not the things that bored people do. This is what God wants, is that we enter into his presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, as we sang this morning, with joy bubbling up and over, not yawns. I don't want you to be bored. God doesn't want you to be bored. And here's the thing, I know that you don't want to be bored either. You didn't get up and roll yourself out of bed and make your way down here in order to be bored senseless. But sometimes it happens. You've all experienced it. I've experienced it. So what is the antidote? What is it that prevents us from that? Is it laser lights and smoke and loud music? I don't think so. The antidote to boring worship is found, I believe, in the passage that we read this morning. If you would, turn back with me to Romans chapter 12. I want us to reread verse 1. Because in verse 1, what we have is Paul's antidote to boring worship. Romans 12, verse 1, reads like this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, and this is the key part, which is your spiritual worship. We are to present our bodies to God, which is our spiritual worship. You know, a lot of times, when people come to this verse, they come to this verse and they think, well, this has to do with our bodies. And if we're going to present our bodies to God, well, we want them in as good a shape as we can have them. So we, you know, it's about the stewardship of the body. We should exercise and we should eat right and we shouldn't smoke and, or chew or go with girls who do. We shouldn't do any of that. <laughs> we should be good about our bodies. And so we think of this verse as a verse, a proof text, if you will, about the stewardship of our bodies. I think that completely misses the point. It, do, it is not what Paul is getting at. It's not the context with, within it he writes. I think what Paul has in mind is this is supposed to be counter-cultural to the worship that his people experienced in his day. See, in his day, the, the, there was still the sacrificial system that was set up in the Old Testament was in effect. So to worship God, you would come and you would bring a sacrifice. And at certain times of the year, and for certain reasons, that sacrifice would be a dead animal. What Paul is saying is, that's all well and good, but what God really wants for you is to present not a dead body, not a dead animal, but a living body. What God really wants is you to present yourself your whole self, your whole life is a sacrifice to God. And when you do that, worship will never, ever be boring. Based upon Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I have a definition for you on worship. This is what, this is my definition, but this is how I would define worship for you. It is the people of God entering into the presence of God and bringing what belongs to God. The people of God entering into the presence of God and bringing what belongs to God. See, that's the key. 
the key, and I don't care what kind of worship style we're talking about. You can have the whole gamut, but if you go into God's presence and you bring yourself and you offer your whole life to God as your spiritual act of worship, that will never, ever be boring. But how do you do that? That's the hard part. This is the difficult part of this verse. Now, how exactly do you go into God's presence? We're not really sure, but we know that when we do that, there is this tension. It has always been a challenge for humanity because there is this tension involved in the act of worship. Are we recognizing the whole, complete picture of God? See, I think there's a tension in worship because there are two qualities to God. One quality is that he is um, um, imminent. And that means that he is present with us, that he is right here. And that he, he walks with me, you know the hymn goes, he walks with me and he talks with me and he, he's here and he hears my problems. The other quality, though, of God is different, that he is transcendent. He's not just down here, he's up there. He is managing the universe. He is up there so far removed from us because he's the creator. And we are the creation. And we don't begin to understand what this creator God is like. And so he is way, way up there. But he is also way, way down here. So he is far removed but he is near. Now, we don't know how that works. It's a mystery to us. We don't know how God can, at the same time, be sitting next to us and listening to us and yet managing the cosmos. We don't know how God can pull both of these things off at the same time, but we need a God who can be both transcendent and imminent. We need a God who is above us, and yet we need a God who is with us. And when we worship God, we need both things in place. We need to worship the whole God, one who is far removed and un not comprehensible to us, and yet one that we can trust who can listen to us. We need both things. And there's tension in that. And we don't like tension. Human beings don't want tension in their lives. We tend to resolve it any way we can. And this is true in worship of God. We tend to want to resolve this tension. And this is how we do this. Worship styles tend to gravitate either toward the transcendent or to the imminent. So worship that is very high church, very liturgical, very formal, very traditional, tends, and I use the word tends very carefully, tends to uh, offer a God or present a God who is transcendent. See, in formal, traditional, high church, we talk about and we sing about a God who is way up there. And some people are real comfortable with that, but some are not. The other way that we sort of uh, you know, resolve this tension is by contemporary worship, a very, very contemporary worship, because contemporary worship, and again, this is a generalization, but it tends to be true. In contemporary worship, we tend to emphasize an imminent God, God who is right with us. See, in traditional God, we, we think of God, or traditional music, worship, we tend to think of God in the third person. In, in contemporary, we tend to do it in the second person. In contemporary worship, we're not singing about God, we sing to God. And some people really like that, and some people get really, really uncomfortable with that. And so churches tend to resolve this tension in one way or another, and they can go to extremes in either direction. Sandia Presbyterian Church, it is my conviction, we want to hold this intention. We want a God who is both transcendent and imminent. 
And we want our worship to be about a God we don't understand, but that we can trust that is sitting with us. We want both of those things. We want to be faithful to the whole of who God is. But that means tension in our worship styles. You know, this summer, I have talked and we have talked a lot about worship. And we've talked about, you know, the schedule is changing on August 26th. That's part of the result of the conversations that we've had about worship. And usually when I have a conversation with folks about worship, it goes something like this. I like this. My preferences are for this kind of worship. I've even heard people say to me, God only appreciates the truly Presbyterian kinds of worship. That was David that told me that. <laughs> but but we, we, we usually have this conversation based upon what we like and what we gravitate towards to. And usually it is the process of, us, process of us trying to resolve that tension a little bit. We are going to go to the things that we are more comfortable with. And we're going to try to avoid the things that make us uncomfortable. But our image of God is shaped through that process. We need to hold both things in tension. This has been the conversation all summer. In fact, I forgot to mention this at the first service, but this is the conversation that we're going to continue to have over the next year is we are going to continue to talk about worship in this church, especially the contemporary version. And if you are interested in being part of that conversation, I forgot, again, I forgot to mention this at the first service, but if you would like to be part of that team, this team that we're developing to have this conversation, then just see me afterwards. I'd love to have you come and be a part of that. But the schedule is going to change. And the reason the schedule is going to change is because we are going to make sure that we worship a transcendent and an imminent God. And that is a real challenge. One of the reasons it's a real challenge for us is because we tend to think of worship based upon other experiences. Experiences where when we go to places and lots of people gather around, And we're there to be entertained. We often think of worship should be entertaining, just like when we go to a Lobos basketball game. You know, when you go to either the, the, the symphony or the opera or a concert or whatever, but when you go to a UNM basketball game, you go there expecting a good time. In fact, your expectation is so big that you're going to have a good time, you will actually pay them for the privilege of being there. (laughs) And they will give you a ticket. And the tickets that are real expensive are the ones that are down front. Doesn't seem to work here. (laughs) Maybe we should charge you and give you a ticket. And then the front will be full. The expensive tickets, of course, will be in the back (laughs) where you all are. But that same expectation is that when I go to church, I want to be entertained. And some churches have been real good at this, and they become really big. You know, a a few years ago, there was a guy named Neil Postman, and he wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And the title is All You Need to Know. That our expectation and the dominant motivator in all things in our society is that we must be entertained. And it doesn't stop at the church doors. We come here expecting to be entertained. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, I don't want worship to be boring. In fact, I'm really, really suspicious when I go to a worship service and it's boring. I don't want that. God doesn't want that. But God has not called you here today to entertain you. 
Worship is God's people going into God's presence and bringing the things that belong to God. And that is you. It's not just about every little piece of your life. It is all of your life. Worship will never be boring if you come into God's presence and you leave him the sacrifice of you. If you come in here and your bags are packed and your hands are full, full of things like fear and apprehension and conflict and struggle and, and, and preconceived ideas about worship should be like and whatever it is that you come in here with your hands full. If you leave and your hands are still full, there's a real good chance it was a boring time for you. But if you come in this place and you leave At the foot of that cross, not only the fears and the apprehensions and the stuff that you struggle with, but if you can leave your whole life, which is your spiritual worship, to present yourself as a living sacrifice, I don't care what worship style we're talking about. It will not be boring. It will transform you. You will no longer be conformed, as Romans 12, 2 says. You will no longer be conformed, but you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That will never, ever be boring. Let's do that together, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, we do thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son to this earth that we might follow you. And now, Lord, because we have given ourselves over to you, remind us that we have to do that on a regular basis. That we have to be reminded that we are who we are because we are yours. You are the Lord, and you are the creator, and yet you're also our friend. You are transcendent, and you are imminent, And Lord, you are here with us now. So as we come into this room and into this act of worship together as your people, we, all of us, Lord, we want to give ourselves to you completely and totally and wholly so that when we leave here, we leave with empty hands. Lord, receive us. Receive our worship. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.